right, good morning. How's everybody today? Oh, come on, let me hear you. How's everybody today? Thank you. Hey, real quick, if I can remember what this passcode is. There we go. want to remind everybody where Pastor and their family is today. We got some pictures to show you. I think I can get out of the way. That is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, our pastor and their f- entire family, they're in Israel. I think they're supposed to be getting back in the next couple of days, pretty real quick. They're headed back. Then you show that next picture. That's from their hotel where they're at. Uh, man, it's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, and then we've got two little videos. You can show that first video if you can. Good morning, Revive Church family. We love you and miss you. Hey guys, we are standing at the Garden of Gethsemane. This is in John uh, where we, we can read about where Jesus bled. And you know, um, in Luke, we read about where Jesus bled and his teardrops fell. Um, and uh, where he told Peter that he would deny him. And this is where they captured him. And this is where he just begged his father, is there any other way? And I think he said some of the most amazing words that we have in scripture. He said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass for me. But if this is your will, so be it. And at that moment, his heart completely set forth on that crucifixion. And he changed humanity forever. Um, This is where it all went down. We were standing on the Mount of Olives. Right across from us is the eastern gate to the city of Jerusalem where he entered. Um, And we're right near the the Last Supper, the crucifixion, all of it's right here within walking distance to one another. But man, I can't even tell you, describe to you what it means to stand in this place, in the actual uh, place, the Mount of Olives, where, where Jesus stood and wept for the city of Jerusalem, where he prayed, where he begged the disciples to stay awake and pray, where he was captured, and then it was game on from that point forward. Anyway, we love you guys, and we miss you, and we can't wait to get back to you. Y'all have a fantastic church service. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye. Awesome. All right, now you can play that second video. Did you? That's the Wailing Wall, Jerusalem. Man, that's a powerful place. People from all over the world go there to pray and to seek God and touch the Lord. I think it's so funny if you know Pastor at all, if you know him at all, you can tell by that video he's telling his dad everything what to do. (laughs) So we just want to pray for them real quick. They should be back in a couple of days. God, we just thank you for our pastor. Thank you for their family. God, thank you for the, the vision that you've given them for this house and this church. Lord, God, just... Um, man, I thank you for whatever you did during the, during this time that they spent in the Holy land, God, whatever you showed them, whatever they saw, whatever they experienced, whatever they felt, God, I thank you, Lord, that it would be a seed that's planted in their heart, God, that, that would uh, take root, that would grow, that would sprout, Lord God, and whatever you have for this house out of that trip, God, we thank you for it. We welcome it, God. We thank you, God, that you're a faithful covenant, God, that never goes back on your word. We thank you for them. Keep them safe on their way home. Um, Man, with time change and, and how that works, God, just we thank you, Lord, that they would get plenty of rest, that they would feel recouped and regenerated, God, and don't, uh, when they get home, let, let them instantly be refreshed, God, that they wouldn't need days and days to catch up on jet lag. Keep them safe. Uh, God, we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. 
amen, amen. Who knows what series we're in right now? The Blessed Life. Man, it, this, I'm telling you guys, this is a powerful, powerful series in, in a word. I need to do something real quick that I, that I was going to have a, a ton of people do it, but I'm going to make a point here. Uh, hey, Brother Tommy, I love you. Can I have your wallet? I, I'm making a point. This is not about money at all. Thank you. All I'm going to do is just sit this right up here. I'm not going to look in it. I'm not going to get anything out of it. Brother Ray, I need your wallet, please. You don't carry one, okay. Brother Jody, I need yours. All right, thank you. I'm going to set it right here. No, 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 you can't offer it. I need somebody. Uh, Brother Billy, can I have your wallet? I'll come get it. I'm making a point right now, and I'll get back to it in a minute. And I'm going to set it right here. All right, man, thank you all three gentlemen for doing that. I didn't talk to them. I didn't ask them permission ahead of time. I just, uh, in praying and, and really getting ready for today, I just really felt that Somebody needed to see that, and we'll talk about it in a minute. This message today, the, the part of this series, is titled, Put God First. It doesn't say, put your money first. It doesn't say, put your tithing first. It says, put God first. So everybody do me a favor, repeat after me, put God first. Come on, real loud, put God first. All right. I'm going to read you guys a story out of the book, The Blessed Life from Robert Morris that ties into today. As a traveling evangelist, all of my income came from the love offerings I received from the church in which I preached. In those years, my income offerings might be $800, might be $200 a week, might be nothing. It just, you know, depending on if you're a traveling evangelist when you go to a church and uh, it depends on what they give you that week. Debbie and I just never knew. But early in our marriage, we had learned to trust God where where our finances were concerned. We were diligent tithers. God had spoken clearly to us about the principle of the tithe several years earlier. And ever since we began honoring the Lord by giving the first tenth of everything that came in, our needs have always been met, sometimes miraculously. What we didn't know was that God was about to take us to the next level. As I mentioned, about a month before the surprise blessing at the gas station, God did something remarkable to get my attention where the matter of giving was concerned. I was scheduled to preach at a church for only one night, and such as it turns out, that was the only meeting that I was scheduled to preach for an entire month. Uh, Who knows any evangelists, or how how many of you have ever known a traveling preacher, a traveling evangelist? A few. That's a terrifying, yeah, that's a terrifying experience to know that, God, you've called me to ministry, I've answered your ministry, I'm going to submit to that, and I'm going to travel, and all of my income is based on what you give me where I go and when I go there. And to only have one service set up for the entire month, that basically that's saying, okay, God, you got to do it. You got to do it right there in that one meeting. Uh, Oh, I lost my point. Okay. From a financial standpoint, that meant having only one opportunity to receive an offering instead of the usual four, five, or six. Although Debbie and I had grown in our ability to trust and rest in God, this represented a major budgeting challenge in the making. At the close of the service, the church received the love offering on my behalf. Shortly thereafter, the pastor approached me with an envelope, and he said, Robert, I'm pleased and amazed to tell you that this is the largest love offering this church has ever given. God Uh, God used you to bless us tonight, and I'm so happy to be able to give this to you. When I opened the envelope, I found a check that was for roughly the same amount as our entire monthly budget. Man, that itself is awesome. Um, In one meeting, God had miraculously provided what it normally took several meetings to produce. It was quite a lesson for us, but the lesson wasn't over yet. As I stood there holding that check, asking Uh, basking in the warm glow of gratitude and wonder something happened to me that forever changed the course and quality of my life. Earlier in that evening service, a missionary 
had given a brief testimony, an update for the congregation. And now as I looked across the nearly empty sanctuary, I caught a sight of him. As I did, the unmistakable voice of the Lord spoke in my heart. I want you to give him your offering, all of it. In an instant, I went from euphoria to something approximating panic. I, yeah, I, I bet. Lord, that can't be your voice. I mean, after all, I, you, you just did a miracle to meeting our needs. And once again, the instruction came through gently but clearly. I want you to give him all of your offering. Like a kid who doesn't want to hear what his brother is saying, I wanted to stick my fingers in my ears and sing loudly, la, la, la. Uh, wait, I can't hear you. You know, you're breaking up. Um, give him the, all, the whole offering, trust me, is what he heard again. I couldn't shake it off. I tried to rationalize. I tried bargaining. I tried begging. The impression only grew stronger. Uh, Ultimately, I waved the white flag and said, okay, Father, I trust you. Uh, I endorsed the back of the check, folded it in half, and took a quick glance around the room to make sure no one was watching. Walked up to the missionary, and he gave him the check. I'm going to cut a little bit short. An hour later, they were at dinner at a pizza restaurant. Across from him sat a well-dressed man that he barely knew. And after a while, that man leaned across the table towards me, looked me straight in the eye and asked me a very personal question. How much was your offering tonight? Naturally, this question flustered me. I had, I've never had anyone ask me that before, especially a near stranger. His boldness caught me so off guard that I didn't know what else to do but to answer him. So I told him the amount of the offering. I remember hoping that was the end of it, but it wasn't. In the same authoritative manner, he asked me another question. Where's the check? What nerve, man? What's this guy up to? And of course, I no longer had the check, but I wasn't about to tell him that. I was too proud to tell him that. And so that preacher lied through his teeth. Uh, My wife has it, he said nervously. She was sitting at the other end of the long table and a, a nice distance away, so he won't challenge that. The man said, go get it. I want to see it. This is the check he gave away we're, we're talking about. So that man was relentless, not knowing what else to do. I made a pretense of getting up to go ask her for the check. He walks across the room. He bends down, uh, and he says, Debbie, how's your pizza? Good, she replied. Uh, Great. Glad to hear it. Just checking. He muttered, and he went back down to his seat. My ears heard another floating lie past my lips. Uh, She left it out in the car, I said, trying to make the car sound as if that was very, very far away. Um, I'd given my whole love offering away, but I was also covering the, the fact that this evangelist who had just spent the evening proclaiming that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life had just lied. As tiny beads of perspiration began to pop out of my face, the gentleman leaned across the table, got uncomfortably close, and he said, the check's not in the car, Robert. He stated in a low voice, how do you know that? And I responded, sounding a little offended because God told me and he told me something else. At that point, the man spoke words that have rolled like thunder through my life ever since. God is about to teach you about giving so that you can teach the body of Christ. With that, he slid a folded piece of paper across the table and it was a check. It was the amount to the penny that was 10 times the amount of the one that I had given away an hour earlier, 10 times to the penny. That was right where the journey started. Man, tithing is not about that. You don't tithe so that God will miraculously give you a check 10 times bigger. But when you're faithful in what God tells you to do, because that wasn't a tithe check that he was faithful with. That was a a gift. And it was, I mean, I, I thought about, I was thinking about this. I I just got paid Friday. Man, if God told me, give that entire paycheck away, I'm going to be honest. I don't know if I could do it. I I would pray and pray and pray and hope that I could. Hope that I could. But I would probably do this. Thank God that's not you. (laughs) You don't understand. You know, like when Mary and Martha called Jesus because Lazarus was dead. And they were like, oh, but you don't understand. He's already dead. It's that same thing that we do. Jesus, you don't understand. God, you don't understand what bills I got to pay. You don't know what's going on in my life. 
except he does. He knows every little thing that's going on. He knows every problem that you have. He knows every flat tire that you have to pay for. He knows every trouble that your kids have that you're going to have to bail them out. He knows everything. From the beginning to the end, God knows everything. So when he tells you to do something, we rationalize God you don't understand, but he knows before he gave you the instruction, so it's a matter of faith. Yeah, and trust, right? So, so that little example that I just did, I picked three men that I knew, that I have relationships with, that I know, that they, we know each other, we trust each other. I can ask those guys for their wallet, and they're not going to ask me why. They're not going to say, what are you going to do? They're not going to go, you can have it, but don't take any money out of it. Because they know I wouldn't do that. There's trust there, right? And, and so somebody needed to see that uh, they may or may not get it back. But they trusted me when I asked for it to give it. And man, that's a, that's a powerful, powerful lesson if we can get that. That God, I put you first in everything that we do, that I do, everything in my life, I put you first. And I trust you enough that when you say, fill in the blank, I'll say yes. Yeah, I would write that down. God, when you say and draw a blank, I'll say yes. Because if you write it down, you can't talk yourself out of it. If you write it down now that, God, when you say and draw a line, because it may, it may be one thing today, it may be one thing tomorrow. When you say blank, I'll say yes. Yeah, it's good. I'm going to get me a shirt that says so good. And every time I preach, I'm just going to be like, bam, so good. So usually every time I preach, I catch myself going, man, that's so good. Man, that's so good. It is. So the question that we have to ask ourselves when we're in this series is who is first? Who's first in our life? And, and, you know, we've given the example, like, man, you can look at your bank account. Where's all your money going? That's what's first. It's not only that. Look at your phone calls. Who are you calling first phone call of the day? Who are you, who are you calling that last phone call before you go to bed? That, you know, that'll show you who's first. You can look at what websites you're looking at, what, what your internet searches are showing, where you're shopping. All of that shows who's first. And God is saying, if you'll put me first then I'll always be a God of promises and a God of covenant. Covenant. God's not able to change. We already learned about that. If, if God could change, that means he could get better. God's already the best at everything that he does and everything who he is, he's the best. So God can't change. So those promises that we speak over our life, that God, you will fulfill the word that you've told me. You will never break your trust with me. You'll never let me down. That's truth and we can believe it. Now, the outcome that we see may not be the outcome that we want. And it may not be the outcome that we're looking for or it may not be the outcome that we understand. But we can trust that it's God's plan and God's outcome. Man, he's a good, good father and he'll never, ever let you down. Never fail, never harm you, never forsake you. Um, Talking about what's first, 16 out of 38 parables are about finances and possessions. 288 times in the New Testament, uh, Jesus talks about it. 500 scriptures in the Bible are about prayer, but there's 2,350 about possessions and finances. Scriptures, that's a lot. Because God's word says where your heart is, your treasure is. Yeah. And if Jesus is in our heart and we're putting our treasure in our relationship with the Lord, it's not about our stuff. It's not about what we own. It's not about where we're going. It's not about what vacation trip we take. It's not about how nice our clothes are or how nice, how nice a vehicle that we drive. Man, it's about God, you are first in my life. And I put you first. Uh, we're going to keep talking about this a little bit, but it's all of this is about the blessed life and it's not man it's just we're teaching about tithing and it, but it, man it's not about money the blessed life is not about having enough money so you can buy all the stuff that you think you need because I promise you God probably doesn't care that you have that new four wheel drive truck 
God will supply what you need to get where you're going. Yeah, but it may not be that brand new four wheel drive truck that you think you need or, you know, that new uh, Dooney and Burke purse or Louis Vuitton or whatever it may be. I'm trying to make a reference to women and men and be proud of me that I knew Louis Vuitton and Dooney Burke. So, uh, man, if you're taking notes, write this down. God is not trying to keep something from you. God's trying to give something to you. He's not trying to get something from you. He's trying to give something to you. And so many times we learned last week about letting go, about we're focused on God like, God, I've got to, I've got to let go. I've got to let go of where I am to get where you want me to be. I've got to let go of what I know how to do to step into that area of my life where you want to show me to do what you want me to do. But it's not about getting. It's about letting go. Ex our first scripture today is Exodus 13, 1 and 2. Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast. It's mine. The firstborn. God says, doesn't give me, don't give me, if you've got more than enough, if you've got 10 or 12, I'll take one. It's first. We put God first in everything that we do. And in this series, the scripture is powerful. Your firstborn, give it to me. And we'll explain that in a little bit, why that's so important. Verse 12 says that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open womb, that is the firstborn that comes from an animal, which you have males shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. God says the first either has to be sacrificed or it has to be redeemed. And man, I don't know about you guys, I, I'm so grateful that God gave us a method and an opportunity of redemption. God modeled this perfectly, and I, I think I'm out of order, but I'm gonna say it right now because it, I, I just it's on my heart right now. God gave his only son for you and I to have life with him. That God didn't have a bunch, and he said, well, I think, You'll be a good one to sacrifice, so we'll do that. God gave his one and only son. Yeah, there's no plan B on that. It was, that was God's plan, that we needed redemption, and so God gave his first. I want to read, uh, I was listening to some other messages. I want to read, I don't have notes on the screen, but this is powerful. This is a story of Cain and Abel, and I want to read this because... There's some important parts. Abel kept the flocks, Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Did y'all catch that? Some. Didn't bring the first. Cain brought some of the fruits as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? I love, I love that God asks questions and he already knows. Man, it's, when, when you read the, the Bible and you, you read stories, because whether it's in a message or it's at home and in your, your private time. I promise you, things like that, like we can read these and it's like, okay, these are the Bible stories that we learned when we were in kids' church. But when you read them like they're real people in real situations and, then, and you're like, okay, God, you created everything. You breathed the stars into existence. You spoke us into existence. You, you created Adam and Eve out of, out of the dirt. You did all of that. And then you're going to ask a question that you already know. I, I give that example a lot of Adam and Eve in the garden. And God says, Adam, where are you? Well, God knew exactly where he was. So God says, why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? 
But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So Cain says to his brother, let's go out in the field. Uh, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Here's another question. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And then, like God doesn't know, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Uh, now you're under a curse that's driven from the ground, which opens its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. The point of that is that they both gave an offering, right? One was, I, I'm going to give something. And the other was, I'm going to give my first. Uh, tithing is so powerful and awesome. And we are, we can be, man, I think we've all been at a place in our life where we're like, God, I can't afford to tithe. I can't, I can't do it. I don't have the money. There's too much month at the end of my money. But man, when, when we realize, okay, God, this is a, a heart issue and it's not a money issue. And God, I'm putting you first in everything that I do and in, in, in my tithes. It's like the principle of tithing can apply to several different areas of your life. You can take the principle of tithing in, in your finances. You can take the principle of tithing in your time. You can take the principle of tithing and apply it to your kids and your family and your work and, and all of that works. What you can't do is take all of the examples where the principle of tithing works and apply those instead of tithing. That doesn't work. And so you, what you can't say is, okay, God, I'm not going to tithe, but I'll do this or, but I'll do this. Cause all that means what you're doing is you're telling yourself, God, I don't have to do it your way. I'll give you something that's better than nothing. We do it all the time. I mean, all the time. And it, it, it just, God wants us to be blessed. God, in, not financially, but in everything that we do. He wants us to be successful in our jobs so that we can bless other people. He wants us to be successful with our kids so that our generational uh, blessings can go forward. I mean, you name it. Like God wants you to be blessed and fruitful and multiply and, and grow the kingdom of God and bless people outside of the kingdom of God. But we can't do that if we say, God, I'll do it my way and I'll give you a little bit. Instead of saying, okay, God, you're telling me what to do. It's really, really hard, but I trust you and I'll do it. So back to that example about the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. You either have to sacrifice it or you have to redeem it. How do you know which one to do? Okay. Scripture says that e either it's a donkey or a lamb. What that means is you've got unclean and clean. And God only requires the best, only accepts the best. Because God is the best. God can't change. God can't get better. He is the best. Uh, so when we look at ourselves, this is what's really cool about this scripture. About if, if you only have a donkey, redeem that donkey with the sacrifice of a lamb. That's a clean, you take an unclean animal and you redeem it with the sacrifice of a clean animal. Were we born clean or unclean? Unclean. And through the redemption of Jesus's blood on the cross, now we're accepted as clean. And so this scripture is the same principle of whatever you have that's not clean, redeem that with something clean. That's the same as us. We aren't, weren't, we're born unclean. And we're human and we make mistakes and we're born into a sinful nature. But through what G God did through giving his only son and making that sacrifice of his one and only for us to redeem us. man, it's just, it's powerful. That's why we bring our tithe through faith. It's not why, it's why we don't, that's why we give our tithe first and not at the end of the month. Because it's not about your money, it's about your faith behind the giving. 
that God wants to see. God doesn't, God doesn't need your money. This church doesn't need your money. Every church across town doesn't need your money. Does need money to operate, but God's going to bring that in however he sees that he needs to bring that. What God needs for you to do is God needs to see your faith in an action, not just the result of what you think you're, you're giving away. Yeah. Uh, God doesn't accept your leftovers. God doesn't want the extra. God wants your first. Uh, it's not the 10% that enacts the blessing. It's the faith behind the 10% that enacts the blessing. When God gave his son, the Bible tells us, uh, when we were mocking him, spitting on him, it's not uh, that he was seeing good results when we were doing well. It's that he gave. Man, that's huge. Like God sent his son to die on a cross in faith that we were going to accept it. We don't have to accept it. You are completely free to live your life however you want to live it, whatever means you want to live it. That's one of the beautiful things about uh, Christianity and our our. our relationship with the Lord and our walk with the Lord is it's 100% completely optional. God doesn't force it on you. It's infinitely better if you accept it. And it's God's hope and plan and desire that you do, but he doesn't force it on you. But God gave his son out of faith that we, we would accept it. Man, it's a powerful Example, when, when Christ is being led to the cross and Barabbas, who's, who's a, man, a, a murderer, a thief, terrible, terrible person. And that person goes, and, but yet Jesus is put on the cross. It's that exchange that God says, I'm going to give my best for you. I'm going to give my best first for you that in exchange, you'll choose the gift that I've given first. Uh, The first fruits of our life must be offered. Let's look at Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all of your increase so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be overflowing with new wine. I want to give you guys an example of, I, I listened to a couple of different messages on tithing and about covenant relationship with the Lord and there are different ways to give an offering and one of the ways that that in the Old Testament they would give an offering is a, a burnt offering you know lots of sacrifices that would be made the, the priests would take those lambs and those animals that were given and they lived off that's how they ate they would sacrifice that animal but then they would keep a portion and that was the, the provision that God gave them because that was a full-time Three, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They were on a different calendar, but you get the point. That was an every day, all day, that those priests had to do that. And so they, God gave them provision to say, of the, of the clean animals that were given, you can take those and that's substance for you. But man, a, a burnt offering. Think about this. How many times do we, do we give an offering? Or do we not give an offering because we say, I don't know what you're going to do with it. I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know who's going to spend it. I don't know who's in charge of the finances. I'm not giving my portion to them, and I, I don't trust them. But, man, that, that, that example of a burnt offering is that you take what you have, and you're saying, God, this is for you, and it's only for you, and I'm going to burn it. Like, there's, there's nothing left to use when you burn something. There's nothing left. I mean, ashes. And I, you know, and that, that man, that's a beautiful image of, of God, like, God, I, I give you this, but, you know, I give it to you. And that, that heart behind that, the heart behind a burnt offering, when we give, we should have that same heart, that same mindset, and that same trust in the Lord. Like, God, I don't know, I don't know what you're going to do with this. But when you tell me to give, and I give, I, I let it go. And God, I've, I've given it to you through my church. But you gave it straight to the Lord. That's powerful. I mean, when you, when, when you learn 
to, to apply that of God. It's not about me giving to someone. It's about me giving to you. Then the whole trust and covenant and relationship with your pastor, with your church, with your staff. Now you know, okay, God, I've walked with them. I know who they are. I, knew what, I know what their heart is for East Texas. I know what their heart is, what their vision is to do with this building. It's easy to give to something when you have a relationship with that something and you know them and, and that trust is there that you don't have to worry about it. Every time I take a drink of water, every single time. Years ago, who watched that Marco Rubio response to the uh, uh, State of the Union? Man, this was like Barack, Barack Obama's first term and Rubio responded. Anybody see that? Okay, like two of y'all. What are y'all doing? You know, it's, that guy got dry mouth, like nobody's business. Scared, I mean, and he was just, I mean, you could hear him. And I'm like, man, this guy's dying. And he, he, and I've never seen it in, in that context. He, he stopped and took a drink of water and I'm like, oh man, but hey, I get it. It happens. But every time I, I take a drink of water, I think about that, that situation. So God wants us to get in our heart, the principle behind tithing, not the application of tithing. Yeah, it's not about rules, it's about relationship. I, I heard that I heard that over and over and over again. When I listened to this message and read it and read through it, man, I just somebody needs to know that. Like it's not about rules, it's about relationship. When and we're already talking about it, but when you have relationship, the rules are easy. It's like you love your wife, love her. Love her with everything that you have. And she makes a rule that you don't completely understand or agree with. Come on, somebody, let me see. Is that, am I the only one? My wife doesn't do that. If she did, hypothetically, make a rule that I'm like, man, that's ridiculous. Like, I'm not adjusting the seat. Lean back Cadillac. Because you like to drive Cadillac. When people drive straight up, that's the craziest thing ever. But when there's relationship there, and I love her thoroughly, when I get out of that car, I'll lean that seat Cadillac back just for her. It's the same thing. Like, man, we love our kids. Man, they ask for the dumbest things. I don't even know what Brogan does. Dad, can I have a dollar for this game? And Can I have a dollar for that game? And... Man, you love your kids and you're like, yeah, absolutely. If you've done your chores and you help me clean. Bro, I was mowing the yard the other day and I didn't ask. You know, we moved from a one acre lot to a little bitty thing, which I love. I'm so grateful for it. And it's like 20 minutes done. And so Brogan comes out there and he's like, dad, can I help you? What can I do? Can I try to mow? And, and I let him try to mow once and it was not good. And, uh, we're kind of on a hill, so to be fair. He goes, what can I do? And I said, go get the blower, and you can, you can blow everything. And I'm like, man, my son, 12 years old, like he gets it. Dad's outside working. He wants to come work. Like, bless me. Then we get done. He goes, how much do I get paid for doing that? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I know, I know. But my heart in that situation is even though like I'm like well that's not right like you offered work he knew all along you wanted to get paid for that right he yeah yeah he knew before he went outside and put his shoes on like I'm finna get paid yeah finna get paid f-i-d-n-a fidna fidna get paid but me as a loving father I'm like man my kid came out there and said dad what can I do I'm like absolutely here you can have it you can have it. Whatever you want, you can have it. And then mom goes, hit the brakes. You've given a lot. Hit the brakes. You know. It, it's beautiful. Man, God loves you. Man, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God created you. God put you in the marriage that you're in. God put you in the job that you're in. God gave you the kids that you have. And whatever of that needs to be fixed that you think, man, this, is, this can be better. 
it can, God can, but be faithful in what you have, put God first in what you have, with what you have now, and man, the sky's the limit of, of what God can do in your life and God can do for you if it's in his will. I always have to put that. Like we, we put all these contexts of God I want, I would really like, you know, if, if it's in his will. So, uh, okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. I wanted to say one more thing and it's not coming to mind. So we have an awesome video that's going to show us a little bit about this. I'm going to step out of the way and you guys can play that video. Can I show you this example? Uh, bring the tables out real quick. This is the easiest way for you to understand this. Either you're going to be a purpose chaser or you're going to be a paper chaser. Those are the two options that you have. And all God is saying is out of 10, bring me one. Just bring me one so I can bless the others. Bring me one out of 10. Bring me 100 out of 1,000. Bring me 100,000 out of a million. And the other nine will be so blessed, you won't even miss what you brought back to me. Uh, let me show you how it works. This is the testimony of people who are purpose, purpose chasers. They come, they drop one. Drop one. And then all the other ones, God says, you can do whatever you want to do with them. Yeah, 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 go to the movies. <laughs> yeah, start a 401k. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and start a new plan. Come on, just, and God said, I'm good with just this one. All this proved is that you had faith. And then when you get more increase, come on, you just put that, I don't need even, I don't need any money. I just need you to put one right here, yeah, yeah, just go ahead and put it right there. That's all I need. And then I need you to lay all of those. Yeah, yeah, go bless your family members. Yeah, take them out for vacation. Yeah, set up for the next generation. Yeah, all nine of those, you keep doing it. And God is saying, this is the principle. When you drop one for me, it proves that you believe in me and that I'm the one that can do this thing and I am first. God's not trying to keep something from you. He's trying to teach you a principle, my God, that will get something to you. Do you look at the blessings of the Lord? Oh yeah, I know some of it's gonna fall off because the blessings of the Lord make it rich and added no sorrow. You thought this was something that God was trying to take more from you. I need you to get the picture. God says every first and 15, honor me with one. Take all nine of them, come on. I want you to see what the next 12 months is about to look like in your family. I want you to see what God is trying to prepare for you. Oh yeah, and it keeps going. Yep, and then he's going to bless you with another business venture. And then he's going to give you a witty invention and an idea. And when he blesses the fruit of your hand, just put one right here, just put one. The rest of y'all, go ahead. Because when you do it God's way, he says that he will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you do not have room enough to receive. I, see, what's going to end up happening is they're going to keep putting stuff up here. And eventually, woo, it's going to begin to fall off of this table because there's so much. Oh, one of them already fell off. It's so crazy that when God starts blessing you because you honored him, this is the testimony of people who put God, shout it at me, first. And please remember, first ain't second, it's just falling off everywhere. Yeah, try to, try to get it out. <laughs> yep. Yep. This is what living a blessed life looks like. I'm going to put the lettuce and make a little kerchief. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to put a little kerchief out here, huh? Yeah. Yeah. This is what the fruit of your hands are going to look like. 
There's going to be so much like after you give them one, you're just going to start putting it down here because there's going to be so much. I don't even have room enough to put it back. I don't have room enough to receive it. Can you see the scripture right now? Can you see the scripture coming to life right now in your hands? Yeah, just start coming in, coming in front of me. Just come in front of me. Just start dropping it off on me. Start dropping it off on me. Yeah, just start, start dropping it off on me. This is what the church will look like in the coming days. This is what your family will look like in the coming days. This is what God wants to do. Somebody's praise is beginning to raise up on the inside of him because years of generational lack and generational poverty and generational cycles of selfishness are being broken because you're going to honor God first. Yeah, I dare you to just begin to praise God for your future right now. Yeah, 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 this is where you lift your head. Oh, his blessing is knocking me over. The blessing is coming over. Hold on, I need people to help me because the blessing is chasing me down. Now, 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 watch this. This is a product of maturity. This is a product of what I was willing to part with. And it made me a part of something else. But it means you have to honor God. Say it loud. First. I got so much blessing. I don't, I don't actually need all of this. Oh. That's when God says, now when I tell you to give extra. Charles. Let me bless you with a couple bags of potatoes. That, I didn't, this is just an offering. Wow, yeah, yeah. That's just an all. I, I, I don't. If I don't use it, it spoils. If I don't, if I don't start blessing somebody, I need some of y'all to come get some of this. Because if I don't start blessing somebody with it, I don't have enough room to eat all this by myself. If I don't leave some for the next generation, if I don't give something to a missions organization like Convoy of Hope, if I don't, if I don't, if I don't get it, it will spoil. And this is what ends up happening. There's so much that now I become a dispensary. God, where do you want me to give? Easy. <laughs> Who do you want me to bless? Easy. Come on, man, that's good. That's so good. Hey, Sarah, you can come on up or John or whoever's going to play. Let me be faithful here. Yeah, no, 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 no. It goes back to the person who trusted me with it. I want to give you all an, an example. I heard this spoken from a leadership standpoint, but man, it, it applies to our life. When God gives us uh, purpose and instructions and action, we can only do what we're capable of doing. So, many, so much time in the day, so many hours in the day. Thank you, thank you. And so high-capacity, high high-level leaders, what they do is, well, what normal people do is use, they say, okay, God, I've only got room for this much. I only have so much time for this much. I only have so many hours for this much. So I'm full. So man, give it to that person. And, and I'm going to delegate to this person, which is not bad. It's just what most people do. High level leaders, what they do, imagine a, a cup of water, a cup and a never ending stream of water. You have a cup and you're like, okay, my cup is full. What do I do now? I'm gonna step out of the way and let somebody else fill their cup up. What high capacity, high level leaders, like I'm talking CEOs, like way more qualified to do anything than I'll ever do. What they do is they say, instead of giving that to someone else, I'm just gonna get a bigger cup. And yeah, I've never thought about that. And God's telling us like, we're so concerned about what we can hold and what we can have and what we want other people to do. And God's saying, all you have to do is get a bigger cup. 
that, that I can pour into you more than you've ever been able to hold. Now, man, you got an eight ounce cup and you broke in yesterday. Man, son, I'm, thank you. I love you. Yesterday we were working out in the yard. I already told that story. I said, Brogan, give me, give me some water. He goes, what do I put in? I said, something big. Like, and I was thinking like a, uh, like a, th- like a steel, stainless steel thermos, like a big thermos, like something big. Like that dude come out with a pitcher of water. Is this big enough, dad? Yeah. Like, thank you, man. You didn't even know. I didn't even know, man, that's what I'm talking about. Like get something bigger. Let God fill you up bigger. I want to tell you guys one more scripture that we don't have on on the screen. Actually, just a story. I told it to our worship team this morning. Luke chapter 10, I think. Are we making sense about put God first? Put the principle first. Don't worry about the action. It's the principle, like apply it, live it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Luke 10, verse 38. This is a story of Martha and Mary at their home. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sisters left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're worried about, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. You guys can stand real quick. I love that that's not even a scripture that has ever been in the context of tithing that I know of, but it's a scripture about relationship, right? Martha's all worried about, man, I got to clean. I got to cook. I got to get all this food ready. I got to get the dishes ready. I got to set the table. I've got to prepare the place. And somebody is going, God, I'm so worried about the how. I'm so worried about the when. Is it okay? Is it proper? When do I do this? When do I don't? When is it right? When is it wrong? It's like you go on a fast and, and it's all about your heart, but people go, am I allowed to eat this? Am I allowed to eat that? Can, can we have this? Is it okay? What if I've already got this planned and da, 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 and it's all about the heart, not about the action. I wanted to read that story to you guys because Martha's concerned about the action and I think her heart was in the right place but her mind got distracted her heart was saying I want to serve God but her mind was saying I can only serve God by doing and Martha was saying God I love you man I just want to sit at your feet I just want to be in your presence I just want to be with you Every, nothing else matters and I brother Ray if you guys want to come up front and the altar team wants to come up front We've, I've said it this entire day, like this message is not about tithing. We're learning about tithing and you can apply the principle of giving God your first, giving God your best, giving without anticipation of what God's going to give back. I could tell you story after story where I was, where Brittany and I were in between jobs and had nothing in the bank and dude knocks on the door and goes, I don't know why God told me to pay your rent this month it happened. I mean, we needed it right then and there. I could tell you story after story. I think it was Bailey. We're making payments to the doctor. Like we're kids, 20 something, no money, like probably practically was not prepared to have a baby, but we did. And I'm like, man, all I can do is I can make you this little payment, a little bit, a little bit, and I'll be faithful in the little payment. We get to the doctor's office and the lady goes, and it's thousands 
and thousands of dollars that we owe. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we know kids are not cheap. Thousands of dollars. And the lady goes, it's gone. It's not here. I'm like, look again, because you're wrong. I owe you a lot of money. She goes, I know you do. I know you have a bill, but it's not here. Amen. And so I'm like, okay, well, keep this because you're going to find it. She goes, I can't keep it. I don't have anything to put it towards. So it's yours. And I go back, to, I mean, a couple of months, every checkup, every appointment, I'm like, where's the bill at? The lady's like, it's not here. It's gone. It's erased. I mean, God is faithful, faithful, faithful. But it's not about what we get back and when we get it back. The, this is my last little little bit one of the the best like I get chills every time I tell it story about where God has proven to me that he's faithful and he's real and he's alive uh, we were at church my dad was a pastor little bitty little bitty church I mean like less than this section of people tiny but enough people that it, it's it's absolutely not not coincidental. There's a lady in the back that my parents were friends with, they grew up with. And uh, she's in the back praying for everybody in the room. She goes, one, two, three, you know. She says a prayer, whatever God gives her. I have no idea. I'm a kid uh, in a prayer meeting. And I look back at her. And then I look back and... Over the course of time, I looked back again. And five or six times, I looked back at this lady. And she came up to me afterward and she goes, you'll never believe this, well, you know, but she goes, I just want you to know that I, I prayed for everyone in this room. And it wasn't a consistent, like, Lord bless them, Lord, like there's no timing that could have happened. There's no coincidence that could have happened. Every time she got to me, I look back at her. I get chills every time I say that because there's no way that could have happened without God moving in that room. And I didn't, I wasn't even aware of it at the time. And God wants you to know that you may not even be aware of it now. You may not see it now, but man, God is moving in your life. Yeah. And he wants you to get that bigger cup so that you can be filled with more and you can pour out more and not say, give it to somebody else. You guys can bow your heads, close your eyes. And I'm gonna just offer this morning, if, if somebody here was like, man, this is, I know it's, this message is about tithing, but I need to really get the principle of putting God first and giving God my first and letting go of my first in faith. And I'm gonna encourage you guys, step out of your seat, come on up front. We've got some powerful, powerful prayer warriors up front that they want to take the time to pray with you. It's not a burden for them. It's not a hindrance for them. You're not slowing them down from getting to the restaurant this afternoon. They want to minister to you guys. I know pastors told the story that he gave, he gave tithing to the Lord a long time ago. But maybe it's an issue of pride. Maybe it, it's an issue of anger. Man, maybe it's just plain Jane trust, whatever it may be. Man, God, we just take time this morning. We let you move. We allow you to move. I'm going to go ahead and pray and close this out. Keep your eyes closed, everybody. And then when we dismiss, you guys are free to go. And if you think you need some prayer, these guys are going to hang around for a minute. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your faithful, never-ending covenant. God, that we can walk in a relationship with you and we can know you. You already know us. You created us. And when we were still in our mom's tummies, you knew who we were. 
You knew our personalities. You knew the color of our hair. You knew our eye color. You knew which one of us were going to have a temper. You knew which one of us were going to be soft natured. Man, you knew the mistakes that we were going to make in seventh and eighth grade. And you knew where we were going to be at 37 years old. Man, I love you, God, that you're so real. I love you, Lord, that, that you never fail. You never leave us alone. Man, I thank you that this word, this message of putting you first, applying you first, giving you our first. Man, the, the, the example of you giving your first, your one and only son for us would give us the strength and energy an ability, God, to give you our first when we don't see another way outside of that. That may be all we have, God, but we give it to you. That may be time in prayer. It may be ministering to somebody at the gas station, whatever that, whatever that giving may be, God. Thank you for everybody here today. Thank you that you've, you've brought them to Revive Church today. I believe to hear this word for what they may need in their life. Thank you for every family represented, for parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and sons and daughters, God. Thank you for what you're doing in our church, what you're doing in East Texas. Thank you for, man, the pastors that I've met at New Beginnings and Lumbee Christian and, and, and Woodland Hills Baptist and wherever they may be. God, thank you for, for New Covenant Church and, and what you're, man, God, you're, moving in East Texas. We thank you that we're a part of that. Thank you lastly for our pastor and his family. Bless them, keep them safe, get them home and fill them up with whatever you would have them to be full of so that they can pour out to us when they get back. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word in Jesus name. Amen. 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 You guys are dismissed. Thank you for being here. Y'all have a blessed week.